Welcome once again to ExplainingComputers.com. A few videos back, we looked at Colossus and some other very large early computers. These were housed at the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley Park in the United Kingdom, where today we're going to return to look at some early PCs. The National Museum's PC gallery contains scores of early personal computers, or what used to be called microcomputers. It's important to stress that most of these machines are not IBM compatible and are hence not technically PCs as we know them today. Instead, most of these early personal computers run their own bespoke operating system, their own dedicated applications, and connect to peripherals that are incompatible with most other makes of hardware. The early days of personal computing really were very different from today. The museum's oldest PC is this Altair 8800B. The original Altair 8800 went on sale as a kit in January 1975 and was one of the first ever personal computers. The Altair 8800B was then released in March 1976 and came with a 2 MHz CPU, 2 KB of RAM and had no mass storage or video display. Programs and data could be entered by flipping the switches on the front panel to set binary values in memory, with program output indicated by LEDs. Alternatively, an interface card could be installed to allow programs to be read in from a paper tape reader or cassette recorder. A teletype interface could also be added to allow direct text entry via keyboard and output via hard copy printout. In October 1975, Microsoft's first product was a programming language for Altair computers called Altair Basic. One of the first fully assembled PCs was the Apple II, which launched in 1977. Here we have a third generation Apple IIe, or Apple II Enhanced, which looks pretty much the same and hails from 1983. All Apple II models had a 6502 processor running at about 1 MHz and were equipped with between 4 and 64 kilobytes of RAM. In case you're wondering, an earlier Apple I computer was sold when Apple was first established in 1976, although this was a bare circuit board to which you had to add a keyboard, case and power supply. Four years after the first Apple II hit the market, IBM launched its first IBM PC. This was technically known as the Model 5150, with the initial system being equipped with a 4.77 MHz 8088 CPU, 16 kilobytes of RAM, and supporting a display that could show 80 by 24 characters. In an attempt to become the market leader, IBM made its PC-compatible hardware platform an open system. This allowed other manufacturers to copy its technology and to sell peripherals as well as clone IBM PCs. The strategy worked, with most PCs today still being IBM compatible. The first IBM and Apple computers ran text-based command line operating systems. However, in 1983, Apple launched this machine, the Lisa, as the first mass market computer with a graphical user interface, or GUI. While the Lisa was not a commercial success, it was followed by the first Apple Macintosh in 1984, which ran a GUI known as the Macintosh Software System, or what is now called Mac OS. Here, we're looking at a Macintosh SE, which was launched in 1987. Also at the museum, they have this Macintosh Classic from 1990. Both machines had a similar specification, including an 8 MHz 68000 CPU, and one megabyte of RAM that could be expanded to four megabytes. Alongside startup Apple, back in 1977, two established American electronics manufacturers launched successful personal computers. The first was Radio Shack, while the second was Commodore. Here, we're looking at the first Commodore PET, or Personal Electronic Transactor, which went on sale in June 1977. This had a 1 MHz 6502 processor, initially 4 kilobytes of RAM, and a 40 by 25 character text display. Later PET models included this second generation 4016 from 1978, which was upgraded to 16 kilobytes of RAM. 
Note that this particular computer is branded as Commodore Business Machines or CBM rather than PET as it was sold in the United Kingdom. Following its PET range, Commodore became famous for selling home computers that consumers could plug into a television. These included the VIC-20 launched in 1980 and this machine, the Commodore 64, which was launched in 1982. This classic home computer sold at its millions and had a 1 MHz 6510 CPU, 64 kilobytes of RAM and a display with a resolution of 320 by 200 pixels. Note that the Commodore 64 did have 16 colour graphics, although this particular hardware is showing its age and outputting a black and white image. Later Commodore computers included several Amiga models, such as this classic Amiga 500 from 1987. This has around a 7 MHz 68000 CPU, 512 kilobytes of RAM, and some of the best graphics capabilities of its period. I myself was a dedicated Amiga owner and used one to produce my first CG images and my first CG animation. Back in the early 1980s, British manufacturer Sinclair opened up the market for lower cost home computers. The first of these was the ZX80 which was launched in 1980 for £100 or $200. As you can see it had a flat membrane keyboard a 3.2 MHz Z80 CPU and 1 KB of onboard RAM. The ZX80 connected to a television to deliver a monochrome display of 32 by 22 characters. A year later Sinclair launched the ZX81 with the same basic specification and by August 1982 had reported sales of half a million units. These included the sales of a rebranded version of the ZX81 which was sold in the United States as the Timex Sinclair 1000. Those wishing to upgrade the ZX81 could add a 16KB RAM pack on the back although the connection was at times problematic. My own first computer was a ZX81 and I will look at the machine more closely in a future video. In 1982 Sinclair went colour with a ZX Spectrum. This again had a Z80 CPU and initially came in two models with either 16 or 48 kilobytes of RAM. The display resolution was 256 by 192 pixels in eight colors. Unlike previous Sinclair models, the keyboard was raised and made out of rubber. By 1983, peripherals for the Spectrum included a microdrive unit that stored data on a loop of 1.9 millimeter magnetic tape and a printer which burnt black marks onto 4 inch wide silver thermal paper. In addition to its early desktop PCs, the National Museum of Computing has a great display of early mobile hardware. These machines include this Macintosh PowerBot 170 from 1991 and this Toshiba 5200 from the same year. This early notebook computer is a numeric keypad version of the Toshiba 5100 that I looked at some time ago in one of my classic PC videos. Also on display in the museum are this sharp pocket computer that could be cased with its own printer and the classic British personal organisers, the Scion 3, as well as its later cousin, the Scion 5. However, my favourite mobile computer in the collection is the Osborne 1, released in 1981. This came with a 4 MHz Z80 CPU, 64 kilobytes of RAM, dual 5.25 inch floppy drives and a 5 inch CRT monitor with a 52 by 24 character text display. The machine required mains power and at 24.5 pounds or 11 kilograms was often described as luggable rather than portable. Back in 1981, a store near my school had an Osborne 1 in its window for some time and I often wondered who bought it, where they carried it to and what they did with its amazing portable computing power. For some of you, the hardware featured in this video will be ancient history. And yet, for others, I suspect it will trigger powerful memories of your own participation in early personal computing. If you do have such recollections, please let us all know about them down in the comments section. But now that's it for another video. 
Thanks greatly to the National Museum of Computing for letting me in to film all their early PCs. If you've enjoyed this video, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.